microphone. Hey everyone, Ahoy Praha. Uh, I'm Gleb Bakhmutov. I work at a company called Cypress, and I'm here with Reactive Meetups Roadshow. So the way it works, we drive from city to city, from country to country, and Mathieu drives, and I play music, and I speak. So it all works out very well. Um, sometimes he doesn't stop on the red light, but that's okay, I forgive him. Um, I have a serious question that my wife usually asks like every day when she tries to go like buy something online and something doesn't work, right? Why is everything freaking broken? Anyone who tries to program a web application or website or tries to use one, at some point gets frustrated and is like, this doesn't work. I'm trying to do my task and it just doesn't respond or it just keeps you know, kind of spinning around or maybe like I'm ordering and all of a sudden like everything crashes and the browser crashes. And you open DevTools because, you know, I usually work with anything with JavaScript. So I have my DevTools open all the time. And, you know, when I see something like this, I was like, this is typical, right? Every website throws errors, hundreds of them. It's just users don't see it. We kind of hide it. But imagine if this were open all the time. Would your company survive like next till Monday? Probably not, because you will have, have any customers left. Even companies that supposedly are pretty good are not 100% good. They also throw errors. To be fair, I run ad block. That means I'm blocking some scripts from loading. But that's a fair assumption because the internet is like a jungle. Like your program cannot assume perfect conditions. It cannot assume perfect network conditions. It cannot assume, you know, modern browser. So it has to do the right thing under very, very different sets of circumstances. So what happens if you don't have a good app? Well, your users become kind of like your testers, right? If your app doesn't perform very well, that means you don't pass the test with users and they stop coming to your web applications. It's a good thing if you, they have no choice, like if you're a bank or a government. But for most of us, the users do have a choice. You don't work at a company unique enough so that your users will come back and back after your app keeps crashing, not doing what you expect it to, to do. So he, here's me. Here's a typical developer, right? Just a fire every day. There is something going on, something crashing. I was like, I don't know why. When I you know, use it on my computer, it worked fine. What is, and like, no, it's urgent. Everything is urgent, right? I want to get to this point where it's like perfectly balanced group of customers, happy to use my web application on an unknown laptop, right? The quality application is, is not arbitrary, right? When I say quality, I mean the app behaves the way the users think it should behave. Not the way you think it should behave, not even the way your manager or product owner, anyone, right? You have to describe and understand what your users are looking for and then build an app that behaves according to those expectations and hopefully exceeding them. So you can do a couple things, right? You can go to static types and languages where you can prove formally that the app will behave a way the specifications are written. Unfortunately, that's very expensive. So the only way to ensure that when our users use our web application is to write some tests. And we all love writing tests. Like, I, I don't know a single person who doesn't like writing tests. Like, if there is a person here who doesn't like writing tests, raise your hand and, like, you don't have to listen to, excellent. You, don't have, you can leave now, like, it's, it's not for you. <laughs> I actually can, can ask, who is a, considers themselves a developer, mostly? Excellent. What about QA or testing? Well, pretty much the same hands, I don't know. Yeah, we all kind of wear double hats, right? We should test our software, then it goes to maybe someone else who tests some more, comes back, and then you have to run their tests and maintain them. And maybe you have to add you know, more tests. So we all have to wear two hats. Testing pyramid, let's start with geometry. So. We have a couple different types of tests, right? At the bottom, we have this unit test that are supposed to test the smallest pieces of software. If you write a function that adds two numbers, if you're lucky enough to have a job like that, you load the function, you call it with a couple of arguments, and you compare what the function computes with expected result, like two plus two equals four usually, right? But this is too simple. But the good thing about simplicity is that we have a lot of good tools in every language that do unit testing very well. And it's easy to do unit testing. 
And that's why the bottom of this pyramid is so wide, because we quickly write a lot of tests, and we cover everything. And we, our goal is 100% code coverage, all the paths, all the statements, all the possible things, 100% covered, 200% covered, maybe 1,000%. I think 1,000 is better than 100. But you know, it, it doesn't really help, right? It doesn't solve the user problem, because by itself, like, every part makes sense. It's a very well-dressed gentleman, right? So we have to do something else. We have to start putting things together. Maybe you know, a function that I wrote with a function you wrote, and see if like, it makes sense. Maybe we're stopping you know, the database calls, but like, our web application kind of is there. Right? So we're trying to see a bigger piece of software and trying to test it. And immediately we find problems, because by itself, functionality could make sense. But as soon as you start testing the whole thing, right, <laughs> it's good if it's not a bathroom door, right? And there are lots of GIFs like that, right? Like you can do a whole hour of just showing this where <laughs> no, just a small problem. OK, so the bigger, a more useful test to me would be at the top of a pyramid, the end-to-end -end test. And that's why this is called end-to-end -end testing, because that's, that's, that's my prize. It's where you test the whole thing, right? The full web application, the full website. It could be running locally. That's fine. You know, it could be running in staging. Um, it could be running in production, but you don't run all the tests. Maybe you're running the full web app but you stop some of the calls, maybe to the payment system, right? But you're still trying to test the whole thing as if a user were using your system, right? And this finds potentially a huge number of issues from you know, the way you wrote like, your code to the way the components actually work together to the way your database is configured to the way the server is configured. Maybe you're missing environment variable somewhere. Maybe your logging is bad, so the system will crash after you start using it. It finds out all the little things, and it gives you confidence. Because if your app works as an end-to-end -end test 100 times, acting as like a real user, when a user tries to use it, the chances are higher that the app will actually work. So I think we should invert this pyramid and put more emphasis on end-to-end -end tests. Right? It's just we don't have good tools for writing those tests. But to the users, you know, these are really important. If you ask a user, what should I test? Right? How my website performs? Or 2 plus 2 equals 4? I mean, 2 plus 2 equals 4 is still really important to me. I write unit tests all the time. Like, don't get me wrong. It's not like we can skip those. But if we put ourselves into users' shoes, we should concentrate on this. OK, enough of theory. So we're at not very many tools for writing end-to-end -end tests for web ap applications. We all know their names, right? And I will never disparage another tool that's open source and is trying to solve a problem, right? We wrote a very different tool, and I'll show it. So it's up to you to make you know, a judgment call. The way you install Cypress, if you want to write end-to-end -end tests, you just do npm install, like a regular npm package. So what happens there? The NPM package downloads a binary built for your operating system. Our tool is Electron um, application, just like VS Code or Spotify. We just don't play music so, all the time. It downloads the binary built for your system, and we build you know, Mac, uh, Windows, and Linux systems so you can run it everywhere. And the whole thing is open source, right? It's a MIT license. Like We're not charging anything. We're not limiting uh, you know, any features. We're not trying to sell you upgraded to a pro license. We're just giving away you know, the full thing for free. We were trying to sell it. It did not work. Nobody wanted to pay for a tool but from a little startup. And the whole thing is on GitHub. So if you have a second later tonight, go to GitHub and give it a star, which, which helps us and helps everyone else to discover it. A test looks like this. Uh, it uses mocha BDD syntax. That means like describe, before each, it. So the test is called it loads the app. And then inside, we just give you a sci global variable. That's where all the commands live. So sci visit and then URL, you can probably guess it should open and visit that website. 
Um, and then we have a command site get and then a selector. So we're trying to get a selector in that page. And we just run an assertion that it should be visible. So Cypress comes with all the bells and whistles already included. You don't have to install anything else. So it comes with jQuery and all the assertions from Chai, Chai jQuery, Synon stubbing library, Synon assertions. So you don't have to do anything else. You can bring additional things, but for 90% of the cases, this will be enough. And and I'll show this. This is how it looks in, in action, but this is just a static image. But as opposed to unit test, where you like call a function, add two and two, compare results, where usually you have one assertion, you know, you keep, keep those unit tests small, the end-to-end -end test actually should simulate the real user. And it's not like user opens a page, clicks a button, and runs away, right? The user usually opens a website, logs in or doesn't log in, right? does something, does something else, then does another command. So usually there is a whole user story. I don't know where the lights are changing. And the, the way you write your end-to-end -end test should kind of follow the same approach, where you kind of map the user story that you're trying to develop, build, sell, whatever, to the test. And the test should read naturally. So in our case, let's say we're testing a to-do app, which is like the top of my program skills. I want to visit the page. I want to get the element with this class. Probably is the input box. And I want to type learn testing and press enter, just like a real user. And then I want to type another to do with an enter. And then I want to get the list items. And I want to make an assertion that there should be two items. Because as a, almost like a user, I typed twice. And I press enter twice. So let, let's see this in action. Uh, I'm going to switch. Oh, by the way, before, we, can everyone see this from the back? I'm always, OK. Uh, this, this test is even simpler, right? I'm visiting a local host, and I'm just checking that there is a, an A element with particular text. So one of the things we were really trying to optimize, we were trying to make sure that anyone doesn't have a steep learning curve. So not only they should read naturally, but we ship a TypeScript definition, so whenever you hover over anything, it actually displays IntelliSense with examples. You can click on a link to go to the API docs. And so every command should actually explain itself. So you know, learning cyber should not be a hassle. Uh, OK, so I have my app running. Let's see, just to make sure that it is running. It's right here. I, I can add items. I mean, it's, it's unbelievably useful app. Uh, and I can open Cypress with Cypress open command. There are only two commands to remember. So Cypress open is the one you use when you work locally. It starts with Electron app, which right away shows for my project the list of specs files, right? So spec files have my tests. So the first test that, that's right here, the basic one, is right here. So when I click, Cypress opens a real browser. In this case, it's Electron, but I can you know, stop it and pick Chrome. We are right now supporting <coughs> only Chrome, bless you, browsers. So uh, we can talk about cross-browser support later, but right now it will find Chrome or Chrome, Chromium, Canary, whatever, or Electron. It comes with Electron already, so. And I prefer Electron, so I don't have to worry about anything. So it opens a real browser, and my application is actually iframed right here. So this iframe contains the actual website. You, you don't have to test localhost. You can load anything. The way Cypress you know, works, you will see, is that it runs the tests right inside the browser, because it actually iframes its command log in the same window. It runs its tests and drives through all the events right inside the iframe. It has full visibility into what your application is doing because it's running in the same browser context. And at the same time, it can do things like this. So for example, but remember my test says sci visit, sci contains. All these commands are shown in a command log right here. So I can see the full history of a test visually as it's running. Notice that my app actually made XHR request. So it actually went to the server when the app loaded, and it grabbed probably a list of to-dos from the server. And right now, it's just XHR. 
So the way Cypress works, it becomes a proxy to the iframe domain. That's what I'm testing, right? And it actually intercepts all requests coming from my app to the network. And we'll see, like, you can do cool things with that. Right now, we're just observing them, right? Oh, yeah, there is an, uh, a call to, to an API. But we can intercept, spy, stop those things with pictures or really do anything. And so you can actually test any domain and we'll insert self-signed certificate into Cypress proxy to intercept those domains. So it's actually pretty useful, you know. And in this case, whenever I hover, notice like right here, look. Right now it just shows text and it highlights the element in that particular command, right? And right now this is a very short test. It's not a realistic test. It's good enough because the way Cypress runs these commands is that they're all queued and for example, visit has to finish successfully before contains command runs. Even the visit command by itself does checks. For example, it will check that your server responds with 200. It will check that your server actually returns content text HTML. It will check that your applica well, the application fires load event. It doesn't crash. So site visit by itself has built-in assertions that Cypress will actually understand and will not continue unless command passes. So let's look at more realistic tests. And in this case, um, probably this one. Um, adds to items, right? So I'll just focus on that particular test for just for now. Again, like observe it, you can actually see everything running inside uh, the iframe. But but you can do more. And, and here's where like developer experience comes into play. So what happened when you visited the page? Well, notice how the iframe actually switched. So and whenever I hover over command, the things actually showing in iframe are kind of different. So when Cypress runs the commands, it will observe the DOM of your iframe application. And every time it notices that the DOM has changed, it will take a snapshot. So when you can actually go to each command, it restores that snapshot to show how the app looked at that particular moment. So it has this time traveling debugger that allows you to actually see all the actions and what the, you know, your app looked during those actions. So if you write a longer test that kind of you know, goes like a user story, it's fine. Even if it fails somewhere in the middle, you don't have to hunt. You can just go for each step and see what the app is actually doing and see why it's failing later. So it's okay to actually write longer tests because there is a time traveling debugger. Another thing, but on each command, we try to give you a useful output. So the get command, whenever I hover, highlights the element that it actually grabbed with that selector. If I hover over type, notice that this becomes, starts showing an animation of before and after. Because Cypress noticed that when it did that command, the DOM has changed because my app went and actually inserted that item into the list. So it shows me before and after snapshots. And you know, I, I can pin them, look at them. I can open my dev tools because I keep them. Anytime I, you know, I click on any command, it actually shows all additional output but doesn't fit on the screen. It shows it in a console and I can go and inspect the element and see what it actually found and how it interacted with it. Even the things that I didn't have to explicitly tell Cypress, for example, this post request, right? So what, what happened there? Well, I can just click on it and I see that there was a request to slash to do's and I can look at the request object, I can look at its body. Oh, this is what my app actually sends. Oh, that's cool. I can actually see if it actually made a mistake, if maybe the ID was wrong. And in this case, what did the server respond with? Well, it's the same item, right? But in a real application, it could be something else and something useful. And I didn't have to do anything because observing the network is already built in, nothing to configure. So this is a command, contains um, ally with class to do and contains text, first item, and it actually found it here. So it shows me. 
And this is an assertion. You know, I expect it to be visible, and it was visible. So my test really should read naturally. Right? Almost like an English sentence. Right? Notice also there are no weights. Right? I didn't have to tell Cypress to wait for five seconds or wait for this element to be visible before starting typing there. Again, every command has a built-in assertions and built-in ways how it waits. So for example, if I'm trying to type into element that was received from this command, well, Cypress will actually check, do you have a valid element? Do you have more than one element? Because maybe your selector was wrong and you know, returned you five boxes. But the real user doesn't type into five boxes simultaneously, right? It only types into one. Do you, do you have a valid element that can be typed into, right? An input or like text editable. Now, is that element actually covered by something else? Maybe the real user cannot type into this input box because there is some kind of freaking pop-up, right? So it will actually run all these assertions under the hood and only continue to the next command if this passes. But here's something else that I really like. So well, let me just add. So I want to get those to-do items. Uh, no, the to-do. And I really expect two items into this um, array. Oh, by the way, so we have IntelliSense all assertions, because I can never remember them myself, so I always have to kind of follow the IntelliSense. Uh, anytime I'm changing something in a spec file, Cypress will watch and rerun this. So like you see, it's already rerun this test. And um, so here's the interesting thing that we built into Cypress. And this is only possible because we run in the same browser as the app itself. It would not be possible if we actually ran in Node and just send commands. So we expected to have two list items, right? And we found two. That's great. What if we expect, let's say, eight? Well, the test actually kind of hangs around. And then it fails. And it fails, and let me just zoom it up. Timed out retrying, not enough elements found, found two, and expected eight, right? But again, like notice that I it didn't immediately fail, even though it got elements, right? They're there, I can see them. It actually waited for four seconds. So every command in this case, the command is this one, get, right? Command, and this is an assertion. So every time an assertion fails, it doesn't immediately fail the test. Instead, it goes to the previous command and says, hey, run again, and checks again. And it fails again, and then goes back to the command and checks it, right? And it kind of continues retrying and retrying for up to four seconds by default. Because we know that the web is not synchronous. Nothing happens when you expect it, right? Like only rent, but other than that, the things actually take longer than you expect. The network might usually respond in 100 milliseconds, but responds in 10 minutes, right? The web, you know, the browser could be actually doing something, you know, some job just busy and not responding for a while. So this retryability is built into every command and every assertion. So the assertion goes to the previous command, doesn't go up the chain, like it will not, not rerun the whole thing, just goes to the previous command and will retry and retry and if it succeeds, good, it just goes to the next command. So you never have to wait longer than necessary. It's not like you have to like scythe, wait 30 seconds, and then check, you probably will be good, right? And you can vary the timeouts as a global variable, or you can just say per command, and let me just set it to something long. So right now it just keeps retrying, okay? And retrying and retrying. And you know, this is a live app, so Ahoy, right? And all of a sudden, expected this list items to have a length of eight, but got three. Well, I, I do see three items. Four? Oh yeah, got four. Okay. Five? Six? 
seven, oh, we're pushing it. Now, what do you think will happen when I enter eighth item? It's okay, don't be shy. I, I know you know the answer, right? <laughs> okay, eight. Boom, the test just passed. Because it kept retrying and retrying and retrying, right? And it actually highlights the element it found. So this is great. I like it myself. You know, when I saw this built in retroability, I was sold. I actually became aware of Cypress a year before I joined the company. And I convinced my CTO to, to give him a try. We got into private beta. We believed in this little startup with like five people. We had a screaming match because he was like, no, they are known. They can just fold. We'll have to write our tests. I'm like, our tests already suck you know, as much as possible, right? There's, there's no way we can lose right, by trying it. And we tried it, and we liked it, right? The error messages, the command log, the built-in debugger, the retries, I was sold. But then I saw something else, right? So this is interactive mode. This is what I'm doing when I'm working. Tests on one, like rerunning on one monitor and my editor on another, so test-driven development. But then I saw something else. Well, I saw the second Cypress command, Cypress run. And this is a command that you would run on the server in headless mode. So to spec. So in this case, I just want to run that particular spec file because I have a lot. So this is what you would do on your CI server. It, you know, it found the spec. It starts write, writing it. Great, great. Of course, it fails because we know it fails, right? So he, you know, imagine your usual kind of debugging workflow. A test failed on CI, what do you do? Well, first of all, you call your mom, don't wait for dinner, right? I'm not coming home because it will be a long night. <coughs> I guess I do long, okay. Usually you get a stack trace, and stack trace, I mean, look at this beauty, right? Throw error, no, no, settle promises, right? But the error message is the same as we saw in the desktop itself. It's already kind of useful, but like I have no idea which items it found and so on. But then you scroll down and you actually see something else. Screenshots, I, like, I didn't take screenshots. Let's, let's open the screenshots. And it's long name because of a test name. Ooh. So by default, Cypress will take a screenshot on failure automatically. You don't have to set anything up. And it takes it immediately when the assertion fails and it times out. So that's why this didn't even like refresh and did not re-render because if we actually do that, then your app might actually change and not look the same as when it failed. So we try to, to take the screenshot immediately before we do anything else. So I thought, well, now I can actually see what's going on. I can call my mom and say, no, I'm coming for dinner because I can debug this, right? But then I saw something else. Not just I have screenshots, I have video. Like, I didn't set up video. Let's see. What's that MP4 file? Well, first you have to watch an ad. No, I'm just kidding. Oh. So by default, Cypress takes a video of a test run, okay? And it does this without any additional dependencies on every platform, on any CI, okay? And this is what makes it so freaking useful, because I can see how my application behaves in all these intermediate steps. I can pull the video from a passing test and just compare side by side and think, oh, oh well, the initial to-dos didn't load. Of course, now there's the wrong number of items. And not only, like, like my mom is happy, I can come home early and not wait you know, in the office. So the built-in screenshots and videos, I think, really optimize my workflow as a developer, right? And we're working on further optimizations, like, you know, for example, giving you like everything that happens in the browser, like all the console logs, all the errors from application, whatever it is. So I like that. Uh, what else do I want to show? Does anyone have any questions while I'm opening Cypress? It's Electron app, so it takes a couple seconds. So yes. Can I jump by a little bit before I run it in, in Cypress? Right. It's an excellent question, you know. I see what you're already trying in your mind to use it, right? <laughs> so by default, Cypress comes with Browserify built-in transpiler, so you can use CoffeeScript and JavaScript, right? Um, and then we also have Webpack plugin, 
So you can use your Webpack to transpile the same code. It supports ES6 out of a box. So usually you don't have to transpile much. But if you want, let's say, TypeScript support. Oh, so I was missing flow with your function. Why would you use flow? Because it's better than TypeScript. Sure. Yeah. Sit over there. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Stay where you are. OK. Um, yeah, we, we don't have flow support, but like, I would love to see it. But you can do it. Yeah, we web, yes. So we provide plugins and anything that can. Unfortunately, you oh, okay. everything that re literally runs in a browser, right, has to be JavaScript at some point. So your language, if you prefer, I don't know, C sharp, just find a web plug plugin, and then you can write your test in C sharp, right? Well, you only have two choices, right? JavaScript or VBScript by now, and not even. Anyway, so. Bunch of tests run as fast as possible if they're fixed. I want to show something else, and I want to show network. Uh, so imagine network requests. Um, like, like write this. So I'm going to close this adding things. Here's the test. So we noticed that our application was making a request when it started. And we also saw that it's actually posting new to-do items to the server, because we see those XHR calls. So if we can you know, see them, why can't we use them inside our tests? Because really, our application, and like I'll have a slide on that, it updates the DOM. But it also makes other observable things like network requests, console logs, you know, local storage access, sets cookies, all those like, things that we can actually test. So in this case, if I want to test the network request and see what's happening, I have to do just two things. So I have to start Cypress internal proxy, which will actually stop and spy, not just like log them, with a server command. And then I can just define a route. And in this case, I'm interested in gets to the URL slash to do's. And I will save this route under an Alice. And then I visit my page. So at that particular moment, I expect my app to make that particular request. So I can actually wait using an Alice. So this is an assertion, but not against the DOM. Not that an element was visible or disappeared or have like certain number of items, but instead it's like wait for that get you know root that I just defined. That should happen. If that request never comes in, if my app is misconfigured and never makes a request, this step will fail. Okay. Yes. You're such a smart crowd. Like I'm, it's an excellent question. Um, so right now we stop XHR requests. So if you use fetch, you, like, you can like, remove fetch from your window and force it to be XHRs. The problem with GraphQL is that everything happens on a single endpoint. right? So you know, your stopping will just have you know, the same route. Right? So people came up last week, or well, two weeks ago, with two different solutions. There's a company in Boston that did a module called like Lunar Code that uses Cypress, but you can send your mocks to the GraphQL to stop it on a server. And they did such an amazing job. They make it as simple as possible. And then another guy from Brooklyn came and, well, we're trying to hire him, so it wasn't random. And he's like GraphQL like God. And he wrote as a proof of concept stopping for GraphQL endpoints in TypeScript, like you would not believe it. Like it, that code was like super elegant. So you can stop GraphQL inside the browser. So there are ways and there'll be like plugins. Yeah. Any other questions? This is like really high bar for questions already. So <laughs> excellent. OK. So I waited for this to do this to happen. And Cypress kind of changes its UI a little bit. It now has this new section called routes, because I have to know like what am I doing there. 
it has uh, to do. It wasn't stopped, so I wasn't interested in actually modifying this behavior. It still went to the server and came back. I gave it an alias, and that particular route was called by my app once. And when did it happen? Well, after visit, when it actually notices the alias, because my app did this. And I waited for this, and then I checked the DOM. If I can check observable DOM, I can check the network, right? And so we can say, so I'm waiting for a request, and that will resolve with an object, and I can grab from that object response.body. Because if I look at this thing, right, that's an object, and it has response and a body. If I see it in DevTools, I can test it. So I'm saying from whatever this resolve to, grab response, then grab body, and I expect it to be an array of length zero. If your test is more realistic, you probably have more data, and you probably should have a different value. Oh, well, it already ran like stupid, too fast. So it grabbed to do's. Then from that object, it grabbed response that body and assertion pass because an empty ar array should have a length of zero. By the way, I, I do have a trick. So like when this, I have a special command called pause. It's not really special because it's part of API. It's special to me because I worked at Cypress for a year before I found out about this command, right? I was like, why didn't you tell me? And, and this gives me like this control like in the player and I can just run each command one by one so I can see what happens. Like I, th I think it's pretty convenient and I, I never use it anymore because I know what I'm doing but like if only I knew about it a long time. So if I can do assertions like this, then I don't have to sp just spy on a request. I can also provide a third argument to the route and that will be the response now. So instead of going to the server, when that route matches, it will get, get that object and just return that as a response. Okay? In this case, I'm just giving empty object, right? But I still I can make, you know, uh, where did it go? I can still make the same assertions as before. So stopping API is, is very easy. It's even easier if I don't have to hard code data and it, if I, for example, or it's a good one, if I provide the name of a fixture file. So you have spec files and you have fixture files. And the fixture files in this case is called two items. It's just a JSON file, right? Nothing fancy. So what I'm saying here is that when this request happens, load the data from the JSON file and just give it as a response. Okay, and again, like th this thing now shows XHR stub. Uh, the route shows that this was stubbed. I don't, I don't need an alias because I'm not interested in that. I'm just interested in what happens after that. So in this case, when my app asked, it immediately got two items, right? So this happened. It actually shows what the dump change after that network request. And then I'm selecting these items and they're there. So I can spy on network traffic or I can control the network traffic. And we're working on rewriting of this layer so you can not just like stop and spy on XHR request, but on any request. You wanna stop your CSS? Okay, you, you, you can do it. Uh, you wanna stop your JavaScript load, your service worker load, no problem. You wanna stop something else in your browser, whatever, whatever goes over the network we should be able to stop and spy. Yes, you had a question in the back. In the most primitive way, we override XML HTTP request object in the browser because we run the test in the browser. So it's easier for us to go to this iframe, grab XML HTTP request object and stop and spy it using over shelf, you know, third party library. But soon we'll do a real one in, in a network layer. Yes, you had. Uh, 
It's an excellent question. Did you look at my slides? No? OK. So this form, right, is very simple. Just a method and a URL. The real thing is this, right? Oh, it's some of the things. I can give you know, the whole object of things. And so for example, in this case, when this URL gets hit, I'll, I'm giving this as a response, but I will, I'm doing 404. I'm trying to see how the app responds when it gets 404. And I don't want to do it immediately. I want to do it after, let's say, five seconds. Uh, probably, yeah, let's say five seconds. So notice the stop is waiting and many times out because my other assertion is time out, right? So probably, let's say, three seconds. OK? And uh, so in this case, I stopped that call, and I would delay it by three seconds. I return 404 with some text. But what do I sort against, right? In this case, my app is a very simple app. It doesn't really do anything to show the error message, right? It just did nothing. But what happened under the hood, it actually printed the error in the console error log. That's good enough for now, right, I would say. But how do we test this? How do we actually make an assertion that the app really printed something in console log in the, with a console error? So when I visited that URL and my apps are loading, I can define more options. For example, I can on before load when the iframe is ready, but nothing else loaded, I can start spying on a window console error method. Because my code runs right next to the iframe where my application runs. So I can reach in and I can say, oh, by the way, set up a spy here on anything. Or stop it. I can overwrite math random, but gives me superpower, right? So in this case, I'm going to spy on, on window console that error method. I'm going to save it as an alias, just like I saved my network as an alias. And then I let the app load. Oh, by the way, so every test resets the whole thing. It completely blows away the iframe, and it creates a new one to isolate one test from another. That's the best practice. Like, don't like build part of a state in one test, then another, another. Just start from scratch so you can rerun each test by itself when you debug it. So my app loads, and then I'm just asking back for that spy. And it should have been called with exactly test does not allow it, which is my response right here. Right? So again, I'm making assertion about an observable thing that my app is doing. Okay. Yes. Can I get a screenshot of the console when the test starts? Why would you have a screenshot of your console? It's only for professional license. <laughs> no, I, unfortunately, no. So there is a screenshot uh, utility that just takes a screenshot of either just your application or the whole thing, right? But we cannot open the dev tools for you and take a screenshot. But you can easily, if you can spy on this, you can actually save all arguments for every call and then dump it yourself. So you don't need the screenshot. Screenshot is not useful because it, you cannot scroll it. Yeah, right? just some info from the you, you can actually define your custom Cypress command and then you can implement anything you want. OK, so this was good. So I just want to, OK, so I've done this. We've done this. I can explain this failed XHR call. Nice. So that was technical part. But with Cypress, we have a philosophy. We're trying to have like our, our way of testing because it's very different from like our other tools, to be honest, right? We run next to your code, right? But we have some technical limitations, right? So your app is running in iframe test code runs like right next to it, because of self-signed certificate, we can actually pick inside your domain uh, iframe and we can do whatever we want, right? But your application can't do anything about that, right? We strip like all the iframe prevention me me methods that usually websites use to avoid being iframed. 
Um, this is how I feel when I use Cypress, right? I I'm not in the dark. My app is behind this glass window and I can do everything. I can reach in, manipulate it, spy, stop, things like that. And I'm only going through like things that are not framework specific. Have you noticed? Like I've never done like that Angular component, that React component, what's mo most popular right now, Vue? No, React. Oh, React, oh. It's, I told you to sit over there, <laughs> right? But I was going through things that are completely standard, well-documented, and never gonna change in the nearest future, right? So this means that if you write your tests like that, then you can replace Angular with React or React with some cooler toy like Hyper App, JS next, next month, and no one will notice, notice. Because the test never broke, that means the app behaved the same way, everyone's happy, and you're happy because you just replayed like GSP pages with something like modern. And people do that. This guy was really cold when he took this picture, I think, right? And um, again, th this architecture of building Electron app, controlling the browser, right, means that we're not sending commands from the like, server side, right? Think like web driver. Web driver really runs HTTP server and sends each command over that HTTP by serializing things and then hoping that the web driver inside the browser is ready to receive and does its thing correctly. We have to, a lot of code just to ensure that we can click on a button when the button is ready. We can type into input box when the input box is ready and things like that. But other tools that have more power right now, but they run in a separate context and they have to use the web driver bridge, they're trying to do this, right? Boom. Which is hard. The browser is a complicated machine. If you think about the browser, right, and for us, once we got this system working, going from the browser back to the server side so you can do your file system access, your database calls and assertions, was extremely easy. Because if you compare the browser, what is Node, right? Like Cypress Electron you know, app, that means it comes with a browser and a Node environment. So going from a browser to Node environment is extremely simple because Node is a very simple machine. So we actually have a site task command where you can write inside your backend or plugin file that runs in node environment. That means it can have access to everything in a file system, database, do network calls, whatever you want. And then it just can send results back to your test. And the test can like, okay, yeah, database was saved, perfect. So we have site task for writing JavaScript. We have exec for calling any other program on operating system. And we have requests where you can make HTTP calls to anywhere, no restrictions yourself. You can use it to reset databases or reset servers before each test. You can seed it. You can log in really quickly and get tokens, set it as a cookie, and be done. So it's, it's really powerful. Uh, I don't want to show it. So one thing that, uh, in my opinion, kills projects is lack of documentation uh, <laughs> and lack of internet. Okay, in that case, just screenshots. So as a company, we had you know, choices to make, right? Do we work on something or do we write documentation? And in 25% of the time, we just kept working on documentation, like all of us. We, like, there is no developer who is not like writing how to use you know guides, API docs. So 25% of a company time, and we only 12 people, so it's a lot of full time uh, work. Just goes into our documentation. So you have the docs with tutorials. You for each command you have like huge API changes with all the usage, and we have a lot of examples, right? Because you know. Like, why reinvent the wheel? Why struggle if we can just show you an example of how to do it once? And also, we have tutorial videos. So right now, on Egghead, you can find really good course on Cypress. Ken Siddharth did just a new course on Cypress on like learning, learn to test, really good. But we have the same person who did Egghead did a video course for free for us before. It's pretty much the same content, and it's just as good. So you can watch videos and learn how to write a React application 
and test it at the same time. And finally, we have open source workshop where you can just practice, look at the slides, learn everything at your own pace, and, and it's available. I already talked about this. Cypress open, I run locally, I see the runner. Cypress run is a headless mode that just runs behind the scenes. And, you know, any continuous integration, yes. So like when I showed my test, right, I was I had local server running. Uh, local server. So right. Uh, uncached. Uh, like, uh, uncached, right? So um, you probably should not cache as much when you're running tests because you might actually get very weird yeah, results, I right? That, yeah. Right. So try to like get fresh, that's why we destroy the iframe. Okay. Our suggestion is get a f before each test. Reset your database if possible, log in again, and, and so on, right? Um, but yes, good question. It's possible, but why would you do that? You can save the session tokens, restore them, and we, okay, fine, fine. Yes, restoring session the way like you want it, it takes time, and it's difficult, and you don't want to do it manually. That's, I understand that. So we're working on a command where as you test something, you can like save it as a checkpoint, almost like save yourself in a game. And it will save your storage, all your cookies, the URL, all the data. And then from another test, you can just restore the checkpoint and you immediately get back to that session. So you can still have individual tests, but each test is still isolated and is as fast as possible because you just restore immediately to login state. And so that will be even better. But it's some way off, right? Yes. So what if you have like hundreds of tests and from each run you've got a full video of it, you're gonna take like a lot of play, right? And I'll I'll answer your question in just one minute. Okay. Perfect, yes. If Instagram can do it, we can do it. <laughs> okay, so uh, any CI should you know be okay. We run our examples on many, we have Docker images, so pretty much. If you can drop Docker image, then you you're good to go. Um, bunch of talks. Who cares? Paid features, right? So uh, with, with, we don't make our money from the test runner. That's why I'm not selling you anything, right? We give it away for free. We make my, our money from companies that want to store all the videos, all the test results, and don't worry about it, right? So they pay us for our dashboard, which is like a SaaS thing. And when they r do Cypress run, they can record and it gets uploaded and they can see everything, like it's really nice UI and you don't have to worry about that. And that's how we make money. And it's only you have to pay if you do it for a private project. Like if you don't want anyone to see your testing videos because they fail a lot, for example, right? But for open source project where you don't care about public test results, you can just use it for free. And that's, the storage is pretty cheap because no one looks at those videos, right? Nobody looks at your test CI bills if they're passing. Um, but another thing, the problem is not the storage, the problem is time. Once you start writing a lot of tests, what if your tests run for half an hour, for an hour? So we actually sell load balancing as a service. So if you run and you say parallel and you have 10 CI machines, they're all gonna just split all the tests correctly as fast as possible. And for example, this is a good example. So our dashboard, which is our React web application, ourselves, has a thousand tests and it takes 23 minutes to finish on a single machine, okay? And it's already all the backend calls are stopped. So this is as fast as it can go probably, right? We cannot optimize it any further. And one machine takes 23 minutes and we just run it on six machines and it runs in less than four. And all you have to do is just one command line flag and it's all done for you. And actually as a fun experiment, I did different number of machines Right? We pay for a lot of CI machines, you know, usually. And so, like, if you look at 10 machines for going from 23 minutes to 2 and 20 seconds, it's a 10 times speed up. So literally, 10 machines 
one tenth of the time. So that's the service we sell, and like that's how we make money. But videos, yeah. yeah. So just to kind of summarize, we try to write Cypress, and I joined the company because I really like the product myself. I, you know, it's not like a. Oh, well, I, I did like using it, but it's it was kind of random. But I loved it so much after a year, and I have to c contribute. And like, this is really, really nice. Because like, going from Phantom or Casper, Nightmare or Protractor, yeah, I didn't want to say S word, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Selenium, but we'll talk about it. It's, it's Nightmare, right? And as soon as I saw that, I was like, this exactly solves my problem as a developer who wants to make sure that final thing is actually ready to be used. Because I don't like to be embarrassed. So for me, like running tests all the time, being like with a good development workflow is super important. And like docs are important because like I want everyone to write tests. I don't want to be the one writing the test and having this expertise knowledge. Like that's not you write your own test, right? And everyone will be happy. And I do like that we do everything in an open source manner where people can contribute, where our work is visible. Like we have so many open issues, not because, oh, well, yes, because we suck, but also because people trying to do like cool stuff, right? People come in and like, why doesn't do that? It's like, it should, it should, it's a good idea. Why don't you do it? Oh, no, 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 fine, right? But being like, just discussing things on their merits and not being influenced by money or is this a pro feature versus basic, like it's nice. And I want to finish with something else. So that was like end-to-end, -end, great, framework agnostic, but if you have like React component or view component, you know, or any of those things, like wouldn't it be cool to actually test those using the same API, just load them up, see them, intercept network. So you can do it, you just have to install one of those additional plugins. And as you can see, I kind of went crazy and like, wrote a lot of them, but it's nice. When you see like just that component, like you forget about like enzyme and shallow rendering because you really have a full thing at your disposal. Uh, control application behavior. So it's not a big surprise, but some applications are not as good as other applications. And some applications are not as fast as other applications, right? So imagine your app opens up and it shows you know, input box and you start typing, but the app itself hasn't actually loaded yet because it's loading each component separately and then it's bootstrapping itself in 10 seconds, right? So we have this phantom box in todoemc.com where sometimes the input was garbled, not, not what it was expected. Well, it turns out some frameworks and some apps took a while to load and Cypress starts typing right away into the input box. Because it found the input box and it just, hey, I have to enter this text and click enter. And the way we sold it would not be possible in any of our testing tool that doesn't have the same like, I'm running next to the code. We literally reach into the app's iframe, into the window, <coughs> we grab uh, the element prototype, and we stop out of that listener method. And as soon as we notice that someone is actually using it to attach event listeners, we're like, oh yeah, the app is ready, it's attaching event listeners, now we can start our testing. So we detach ourselves and we actually start our testing. So being able to peer into the app, listen really closely, and we say, okay, now we're good to go. It's impossible to do anywhere else, right? Oh, so, <laughs> uh, this is very important. Um, so usually, if you want to switch to like dark theme, what would you have to do? You have to convince people who write the software to actually change the color theme or like add support for user color theme. But think about this test, right? This freaking runs in a browser. When you run in a browser, you can just, inside an iframe, you can do like parent.window and all of a sudden you have access to the whole thing. So this is how it looks. Okay, so I wrote this little thing uh, called Cypress Dark. 
And, and so, because it's Halloween, I wrote the Halloween theme. It's important. <laughs> right. okay. It's good to pay attention to details. Like. <laughs> But because I'm not a good developer, my tests don't always pass, right? Which one is this? This was uh, four, four. So let me show what it does when the test. Um, well, let's say look. Like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because I can insert audio element, right? Like this is completely user space. You know, modification of the tool you run. And if you're familiar how to write this, you, you're familiar you know, with modifying this behavior, like instance. So it's nice to test in JavaScript anything that's written in JavaScript. Um, okay, so this is the current state of things. What's coming? You can look at our roadmap if you have Wi Fi, but retries. So imagine you have 100 tests, and sometimes the test just randomly fails, so no, no fault of your own. Maybe the network was down, maybe the browser was busy doing, we can't know what browsers do in the free time. But something failed, and if you run the test, it just passes, and you're like, ah, whatever, right? And you ignore it. But that stops the whole CI pipeline, right? If one test fails, the whole thing is red, you cannot deploy the software. So we looked at our data, right, because we run like 10 million tests a month now, and we're like, a lot of those tests sometimes fail like for no reason, and then the next time they run, you know, everything is fine. And if each test, because you're testing complex scenarios now, if each test has 1% chance of failing randomly, but if you have 100, when every scientific you can build fails, but you run it again, and everything, something else fails. So we're implementing retries, and it's a user factor where you say, if a test fails, we try it up, let's say, five times, three times or twice. And if it passes then, continue and don't fail the build. But like, make note of it and show it to the user saying, this test failed, and usually it fails two out of three times. So maybe you should look if there's a race condition. So this, this is, a, I don't want to say an easy feature, but it's an easier feature than ours. Right? So we're going to do it, and it will make your builds a lot more stable, so you can go home. home. Uh, OK, so we are distributed to Chrome. Our users, especially from business side, come back and they're like, we're never going to use you. And we're like, why? Because you're restricted to Chrome. And we're like, then, what else do you want to use? And they're like, Firefox, IE 11. And we're like, okay, we'll give you Firefox. And they're like, what about IE 11? And we're like, oh, Firefox, it is, yeah. So we pretend, we try to avoid this conversation for a long, long time. And we try to write all these guys how like, one browser is enough. Because what's the benefit of a second browser? You're still testing hundreds or thousands of tests, but you know, test the functionality. If it runs stable in one browser, the second browser that runs the same thousand doesn't give you as much confidence. It doesn't improve it by much. Right? So there is a diminishing return for every browser. But there are some bugs that are really cross browsing, like IE 11 does behave differently. But modern browsers with the evergreen kind of behave the same, except for Safari. But IE 11 is really a weird bit. So our advice was always write 90% of your tests using Cypress and for 10% that are truly cross-browser weirdness, use like Test Cafe or Selenium, you know, any, anything else, right? And we had this conversation probably a hundred times, right? With every side of the company, every side of the, every developer. And finally we understood that we're losing this battle. We're not gonna convince anyone and we it's easier to implement IE 11 So we started with Firefox, and a really smart developer worked on a while for a while, he got it to run, and then we looked at the number of hacks and the ways we implemented support for Firefox. And we looked at around and yeah, we can release this, it will have Firefox, but this approach will never work for IE 11 or any other approach. Like what API that you use for Firefox is the right decision at the time but we do need IE11. So we kind of scratched with the release of Firefox and we decided on a roadmap that supports every type of browser, including IE11. 
Because we want like logical consistency in the way we map our actions and our commands to every browser and maybe very many implementation in each browser, but in a very consistent way that will actually work going forward. So I think last week we had a webinar where we showed like IE 11, how we like load it and control it and run like empty tests with like no iframe, DOM, anything like that. So we know it's possible, but it will require effort. But IE 11 is coming. And which taught me a lesson. Like if you persistently nag someone and promise them money, they will agree to them something. <laughs> Okay, full network stopping is coming. It, it's going to be awesome. Like, very no questions. And like the list of ideas is, is huge, right? People want all sorts of interesting things from like server side commands to file upload. Yeah, <laughs> you've been avoiding that question too. <laughs> I also have been avoiding file download, but you don't care about that. Right? Um, so let's say file upload, right? Requires native events. We don't do native events. We only do synthetic events, kind of going through browser in establish. We adding that native events. So, okay, I promise. So we're working on native events. So you can do file upload and all that jazz. Thank you. Thank you, one lonely person who cares about native events. Uh, so we are working on that, and you'll be able to use either synthetic or native events, right? And the only reason we didn't have... Yes, question? Can you elaborate a little bit on the line to take this Okay, so native events, right, the file uploads and so on. It will be different in every browser. In Chrome, we can use debugger protocol, okay, to send native events. And we could not use debugger protocol before because to, to use debugger protocol, guess what? You have to close DevTools. That was the longest open bug, I think, on DevTools team. It's like you have to like, duplex your command if it's native to DevTools and to a browser. And they're like, yeah, fine, fine. And after like, two years, they finally fixed that, but it's not like, even in this version of Editron that we should. Okay? So now it's solved. We can actually use the bug protocol and, and do native events in, in Chrome. Yes? that you will support Chrome in CI? We, we support Chrome in CI. Like you'll read, if you have Chrome installed and you have Docker images with Chrome included, you can use that. It's only limitation is that we don't have video recording in this case. We just haven't updated our stuff to record Chrome in CI. But you can run with Chrome in CI. That's it. And let's say IE 11, to get native events where we're going to use, guess what? So work with start with W and then the driver. So we for some browsers, you know, imagine like once you have commands and this logic, right? You just have to sometimes map different parts of that logic to either debugger protocol or web driver. But only for that particular little piece of logic. And keep like overall architecture the same. So we're gonna use what's appropriate for each browser, like debugger protocol. IE 11 web driver, Firefox probably like behind the actions and web driver as well. So it's, it's going to be a mess, uh, like, despite our best efforts. So that's how we're going to do it. So native events are coming. Awesome, thank you. I have a question. If you want to test your uh, app like on a different size of room, like you're testing mobile, yes. uh, the mobile compatibility? It's not a true mobile compatibility. I, I'll answer your question in several. So first of all, you can change viewport, right? So uh, iPhone says, right? We just changes this re resolution. It's not true mobile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess my answer was. You can at least see like that you have an element that's showing yes. off the page or something right. that wouldn't fit in a browser because it's on an iPhone. Yeah. So it's like simple viewport. Even this is broken because some apps they they when they are in iframe they don't know the true size they use yeah. like the window size so we actually try to like strip away the code that does it but it's better when you can control the application behavior and change its code so it actually takes just iframe but we actually work on that we're going to move this command log out of this so it doesn't take space and we're going to put it right here in this window okay but the, the test are still going to run inside the browser. But it just, your app truly will have full real estate and then it will be working. 
but it's not true mobile experience, right? But after AE11, we think about mobile Safari support, and then probably will be, like everyone will be happy. I hope. I don't know. But it's an excellent question, yes. You have like a really long web page, do you know like how to take a screen screenshot of a full page or not that? Uh, yes, we worked on that. I'm not sure if we really take a full screenshot like in tiles and like do that. Uh, we, you have to look at our GitHub issues, I don't remember right now. But you can take like screenshot of a part of a page or a full page or the whole thing or just your iframe. And you can scroll yourself. So if we don't like take tiles and then assemble it, then you can probably do that yourself. But um, another company actually came up with a very good idea recently, and this goes to mobile and proper support. A company is called Appia Tools. So there are these companies that do screenshot giving, like take screenshots of your page and then compare and like, oh, the CSS changed, so like it went from blue to red. Do you approve this or should we fail the build? So there's like first CIO after